Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Tuesday, May 28th, 2019 Working Group Component Standard Meeting. Um, we do have a few items on the agenda today, so we'll get into those. I think you added those, Leigh. Let me um, let me screen share here so everyone can see the notes. Share. Okay. So the first one on here is the YAML Metafactory one. Yeah, I haven't read this patch, but if we open it up, uh, Lucas kind of said that it was related in some way to the Codec Factory. And uh, yeah, his description says that this enables us to peek okay. uh, so, in, into okay. component configs with multiple documents. Uh, I know Lucas was pretty adamant about having some kind of multi-doc support. I assume that this does it in a good way. Uh, that doesn't just the, the, we merge those other serializers, right? Those were not doing multi doc support. Uh, yeah, I believe that there's there's no support for those. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, because we're not like based on uh, Go YAML or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think we we've written our own, right? Yeah, but ours like if we're using it in I don't know, like queue control, that does multi-doc support. Yeah, I think the last time I looked at that, it literally splits the document on the separators, mm -hmm. which that's like pretty bad um, because you can, you can fool it since YAML is so it expressive. It doesn't escape. I'd be surprised if it doesn't properly escape at this point. I'm sure somebody has. I, I've definitely seen code in Kubernetes that's splitting on hyphen, 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 and dot, 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 uh, which is obviously not, um, it's not yeah, it's obviously not. It's not respecting any escape codes, so. If you had a zero indented YAML, multi-doc YAML document in a string, it would break it. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, What's happening here? So he's changed the Marshall package to probably use yeah this new Meta Factory. Okay. Um, and the Marshall package is being used by Kubedam. I see. And then he's adding a package to somewhere. This is in runtime serializer. It changes the deserializer basically, so to one that supports multi-doc. Is that the idea? Um, Looks like that's what he's doing. Like he switches this library to YAML serializer, and then I'm watching it. He's calling this interpret method on it. Is this an? This is a completely new file. Uh, this YAML meta go. I'm pretty sure. Oh, interesting. And it's pretty minimal. Yeah, it's super small. So this, mm -hmm. let's see. Where's the, what happened to the button that expands it? Yeah. I need to switch this back to um, So this looks like it already supported multi doc.
And this. Interpret. Looks almost like it's designed to just extract the GBK information. What's a little weird to me is I don't see any real um, notion of a collection inside of this Manda factory. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, so this needs to be called multiple times, uh, which. I, oh, interesting. Mm. Generator. So this is, yeah, this is just in a for loop. Look, it's just in an infinite loop. Yeah, and, and it just calls it until uh, it returns an error. Uh, yes, I guess. Yes. That's this one, though. Uh, do I not have Or it? maybe it oh, passes. Yeah. Oh, here we go. It's, it's, and yeah. then it's, it's like not known. It's, it's reading from the reader first. Uh, I see. I, I guess this reader supports multi-doc and is reading one document at a time. Okay. This is really... This must just be the, yeah, split YAML documents must just be the thing that does multi-doc. And for some reason, Lucas wants to switch to this thing to pull the GBK information out instead of whatever we were doing before. It makes sense that we need a central place for that because Kubedm can't be the only place where these things live. So, uh, if right. it's if it's, if it's that simple of a refactor, then yeah, that seems okay. To sure, it's reasonable. Yeah. Um, it yeah. seems like that this that can definitely be used on its own, like beyond just the runtime, the normal runtime serializer stuff. There's no existing changes. We're just moving some code and maybe writing it in a better way. Right. So okay. yeah, at some point, I probably want to dig through like some of this logic and like see if it's replicated in these helpers. Yeah. Um, or if these these look like they might have just been redundant checks, like empty version in kind might just be in the other helpers already. So, um, but yeah, that's that's for code review. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yeah. So, so we've seen this patch probably like four times already. Uh, it's been open for ages. And uh, I'm not sure when API machinery review is going to get back to this again. Well, you can ping them. I mean, we had KubeCon and everything. So. Yeah. Uh, Lucas and Stefan took a look at this last week and gave me a little bit of feedback. Um, I ripped out some stuff. And oh, actually, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you would have some input on this. Uh, if this like looks sane to you, can you open the code really quick? Yeah. Um, so you see this JSON serializer type here on line fifty six. Uh, yep. Okay. So if options is pretty, then we put a pretty serializer uh, into the field called um, JSON type serializer type pretty serializer that comes from this like internal package. So uh, if it's not pretty, then that field doesn't get set. Um, and this serializer type uh, gets converted on init into a serializer info. And the field for pretty serializer is a interface uh, for, I think, runtime serializer. 
which means I think that that defaults to a nil interface. Sure. Um, so it's just a little un unclear to me what the behavior is, and we, we need to write some tests for if the pretty serializer is excluded from JSON. Uh, what's weird is that like the the serializing logic that actually uses the serializer info, it's pretty decoupled. I read it at one point, and it's kind of hard to find. Mm. So I, that's the major thing that's like leaving me a little bit unsure about this patch. So uh, what are your what are your options here? Do you think? What do you mean? Well, you you I guess got this. Well, I I don't know. I guess I'm just not cashed in on everything that's going on in the code. Uh oh, what are the options for? So no, so just like what are you you have like this this thing like what's the choice that you're trying to make? Just whether or not the codec factory will behave in a pretty or non pretty manner or in a strict or non strict manner. Right, but is is the question like how to accomplish that, like this conversation here about constructing a different type of serializer versus having an option, or is it about what you said about the behavior of a nil interface? Yeah, I guess uh, I, I thought that maybe just leaving the serializer off and letting it default would mean that the JSON um, package would not serialize with pretty if the serializer info did not I see have a, a pretty on it but it's yeah it's like very there's no constructor that like sets some of the fields to, to non-zero defaults I don't be more I guess more conventional right just to explicitly set the serializer to whichever one you want to be the default yeah, so the serializer info carries potentially multiple serializers. You can put the main one, you can put a pretty one, you can also put a streaming one. I see. Uh, and yeah, like for different use cases, you'll have some or none of those. But uh, yeah, that's the only thing that I I need to look into more and test out in this patch because this patch doesn't have any tests right now. I need to generate a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I would just, I would look into it and test it and actually know what happens. But yeah, basically we removed some public constructors. Uh, something that you may have an opinion on is if you, I believe, scroll up. Uh, is that the very top of it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's below this type definition. So here's the options stuff. Um, previously, we were going to have a constructor, a new one, um, called Codec Factory with options. That would conversation matter. about two to the end constructors. <laughs> yes. So now we do have the options struct. But then Lucas and Stefan kind of said, hey, let's do this mutator funk thing since, the, um, since it's convenient that the current constructor does not have any options in the arguments. Uh, so okay. instead, in order to enable and disable each one of these options, we have to write a function. Uh, and then if you scroll down a little more. Um, yeah. That's one way to do it. It allows us to keep the same constructor in the code without doing a full refactor. Yeah, uh, there's different ways to so this is like th this uh, you know there's one way to do it is like this with these top level functions where you just call them in a row. Another way to do it is with like with you can you can chain um, those like methods. I don't know if you've ever seen that where, so it'd be like, give me the default serializer or the default factory and mm -hmm. then dot with pretty and then the argument to with pretty is a bool, right? Dot 
with strict, the argument was to strict is a rule. But yeah, so like using a method. Yeah. On the on the codec factory itself. Yes, because each each one could just like return. So you can't do that here because the codec factory is set up when it's constructed, um, and yeah. you have to do. Well, you could. You well, just you could do it on the options, right? right? When you construct the options. Um, basically, by the time you receive the codec factory, it's already generated a bunch of serializers and done a bunch of type conversion uh, and created a pretty complex where's, structure. Where's the constructor for the code effects here? I see. Oh, I see. Okay. So you pass in the mutator functions. Oh, okay. So you pass in, you, you just pass in enable pretty or disable pretty or enable strict or disable strict. Yes. Uh, and that allows us to keep the same constructor, but it, it complicates the maintenance and like if anything in an option was never, wasn't yeah, a Boolean. I would say, I mean, it's in on one hand, it's kind of nice to have these default mutators, but on the other hand, why not just, pass one mutator function in and set all the options you want in that. Like, yeah, or just pass a, a like a, the original like just use a R no. has a, co a new codec factory with options and you pass it an option struct. Yeah, that could work too. Um, but that requires. This, this also doesn't escape that like I'm creating new functions for every option problem, right? Yes, it, it adds serious maintenance burden. And if your if your option is not Boolean, then you have to basically make the user create a function. Yeah, where I've seen this pattern before, it's been, you know, like a single mutator function that you can pass in that gets the whole options, and then you just do whatever you want in that mutator. You don't need these these helpers. Because they're just it's pretty simple, right? I mean I can I can pass funk options, codec factory options, options dot pretty equals true, options dot strict equals true here, where wherever I construct a new codec factory, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's not as like polished, but it's also way easier to maintain. And most people can do it just fine. So that might be how, I mean, talk to you know the folks who are also reviewing this with you, but I think something like that might be a little. Yeah, so this is, this is what we've traded for now. Um, okay. But that's, that's the interface currently. I mean, it looks, it looks decent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's really all I, have to say on this patch, we just really need to get it merged because a lot of other work is dependent on using Codec Factory. So whatever it ends up being, I'm not, we, we actually cannot do this pattern for serializer, which is unfortunate that it's not uniform uh, because serializer, it already has options in the constructor. It already has a pretty option. Just its own argument. Yes. Yeah. So the the constructor it like doesn't even make sense to add mutator funks when it already has an options field. Um, so that just required a new signature. But yeah, this is we can do it here. So. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We'll do what we gotta do. And then, yeah, let's let's just move on to the flag stuff. Yeah, so the um, the legacy flag stuff got merged. Who? Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing to do is to work up some examples of um, real components using it, and then sort of see where the gaps are in the library and and iterate on the library as well. Um, so I knew I was hoping like Lucas or Stefan would be here uh, today to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, cause they both brought up, I think like cube ADM is one option and, uh, cube proxy is another. And I think you, you're relatively familiar with cube ADM's code, right? Yeah. So 
Um, somebody who actually understands those components should go give that a shot if they can. Um, Have you? And this is just for basically flag registration and yeah. parsing, right? Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with like marrying that with config. Well, it's it's um, yeah. You don't have to use it for config, but it's designed to make pasting the flags on top of a loaded config easier. So Interesting. That you, so that you implementing flag precedence should basically be an apply mm -hmm. um, of the flags onto the config object, and not uh, all this magic to reparse the flags without like breaking other things. Like a good example of where that gets tricky is. Um, last week or the week before, we had an issue where all of the K log arguments were being reset to their defaults in Kubelet after flags were parsed, and it's because K log was resetting its defaults every time you called K log .init flags, which the Kubelet ended up doing twice because it was constructing, trying to construct a fake command line to reparse the flags as part of its precedence enforcing path. So um, that's been fixed in, in K log, but it, there's just there's just so many ways that it has to be too perfect when components are reparsing the command line that you can get these little bugs that cause significant issues. So um, this is designed so that you only parse the command line once and then you have all the values in a scratch space. Mm -hmm. And you can apply them arbitrarily as many times as you need. Um, so this and and this was brought up a number of times uh, as a blocker, especially in Kube proxy, to adopting component config and moving to beta with their component config because they didn't want to go through the process of copying the Kubelet's rather complex flag reparsing implementation. Um, so it would be good to sort of prototype this on those components and see like, like does this actually unblock you from moving forward? Sounds like just having written, you know, like plenty of config and flag parsing stuff from scratch that it just sounds like we've really iterated to a horrible state. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, 90% of the challenges come from the fact that we have to maintain backwards compatibility. If we could just wholesale switch to config, it'd be fine. The problem is, even if we could just wholesale switch in like one release cycle to a config and say, now use the config and then all the flags will be deprecated, that would work pretty well. The problem is that there's so many flags and so many conversations around those APIs that you can never get all of them in a single release cycle. And so you have to have a way of iteratively migrating sort of flag by flag over to the config file. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you need to support both. And then you need this merge. And it turns out merging flags into a structure um, when the flags need to take precedence uh, is tricky because in order to load the file, you need to parse the flags to get the name of the file. And then you need to layer the flags back over the config you loaded from the file, right? And the way we currently do that is by reparsing the flags because there's so much magic that happens in there. Mm. Um, and I would like to not reparse the flags because it's really complicated and error prone. Yeah. And so this is this is a way to register flags so that after you parse them, you maintain those references to the values that got parsed separate from anything, any object you'd want to put them into, which lets you repeat that apply on top of foo operation. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, it makes it a lot easier to parse the flags once. Okay, let me load my config file here. I'll just do the apply. And it should look pretty clean in that mm. case. So hopefully this is abstracting away like all the complexity of, of dealing with the layering that maintains compatibility. We just need somebody to go prototype it now. And I, I'd love to do Qubit at some point, but I'm just super busy for the next month because I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, I can... Hmm. 
because once the Kodak factory stuff gets in, we have testing that needs to get in. Yeah, I, you should focus on that because that's what you're doing uh, already. How, how much longer do we have in this cycle until code freeze? Uh, it's this week, I think. Yeah, we need to... Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we should be bothering Lucas and Stefan, I guess, and whoever else is working on your PR. Yeah. And what what time is it now? It's 10.03. I have to join the add-ons call. All right. Um, thank, thanks for syncing up, Mike. This is, this is good. Yeah, you bet. Um, make sure you ping those guys on Slack today. Yeah, I'll I'll be able to talk with Lucas uh, today. Um, cool. All right, thanks, Lay. Good talking. Have to a you. good one. Yeah. Bye. -bye.